Can you hear me? Can you see the screen? Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh. Okay, so we'll continue with the problem discussion. And as always, whatever problems are shared last time, uh, like what we discussed in the class, Please make sure that you go home and try the problems. Uh, and not only try the problems we are discussing, but also uh, look at some alternate possibilities. Like, what if you change some condition in the original problem? How does the problem change? So, do all those explorations as usual. So, have you got a chance to try the paper which I said, RMO 2004? And uh, any, I think some of the questions are quite simple. So, may not be much to discuss in that paper, but any particular question which you would like to start with? So, uh, by the way, the last question in that, the diagram was not given, but uh, I, I will explain it. Basically, you can take that PQRS square in the center of that diagram. So, maybe we can start with the last question. That is fine. So, question 8. Okay. So, the diagram was that ABCD is the 11 cross 11 square. And we, let us assume that PQRS is in the center. Okay? So PQRS is a square in the center of side 5 plus 5. So in other words, there is a gap of 3 on each direction. Okay. And so basically we have to count the number of rectangles which will not overlap with the central region. Okay. So anybody who has already solved this problem? Or in case you did not know where that uh, middle portion was. So in that case, you may want to try it now. Okay, so count the number of rectangles which don't overlap with this central region.
Yes, Rago. So I think I found a method how to solve the problem. Yes, go ahead. So basically, you can consider like uh, each like uh, eleven by three uh, rectangle. Okay. Form by on the sides. Okay. So like this one. Yes, sir. So you calculate okay. the number of rectangles in those, and you multiply okay. it by four. Then we are over okay. counting the rectangles. Uh, we're counting each rectangle formed in those small square corner region. This one. Twice. Yeah. Sorry. We can subtract those, and I think we should get the answer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That sounds good. So basically, it is inclusion exclusion of some kind. That uh, for example, we the four uh, rectangles that you talked about, right? These long regions. So we can say let a one, a two, a three, a four be the those sets. So let let a one be the left eleven cross eleven, uh, eleven cross three set. So the the set of all rectangles will belong to the left one. And similarly, we can define a two, a three, a four for the remaining four rectangles. And what we would like to count is the union, right? So union of all of them. Firstly. Uh, do we agree that this union will contain all the rectangles that we want? There will not be any rectangle uh, which uh, will be outside of this set. And and the reason for that is that, uh, I mean, if if there is any rectangle, it does not overlap with the central region, right? Like we cannot have a rectangle of this shape, right? Which partially here and partially here. If every rectangle will have to be completely contained contained in one of these a one, a two, a three, a four. So therefore, by inclusion and exclusion, we can simply count this, and so that will be equal to sum of the uh, individual rectangles minus sum of the pairwise intersection. And then there will be additional terms, but those will be zero, right? Like sum of three at a time. And what are remaining term? So the, these terms will be zero. So we don't need to worry about them. So only these terms will matter. And basically, this the first term is the direct counting of each of them, and the second term is exactly the three cross three rectangle that you were talking about. Right? This is the three cross three rectangle or, or square region. So we can com compute those two separately, and you will get the answer. Is that fine? Yeah. Any any other strategy that can be pursued? If anybody has an idea. One more idea could be, you know, uh, total minus bad. So count the total number of rectangles and then subtract from those all the rectangles which necessarily overlap with the central region. We have to think whether that 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 bad number is easy to count or not. If it is easy to count, then that could also be one strategy, right? So can you think about how? Suppose the question was count all the rectangles which necessarily overlap with the central region. Is there any direct way to count that? So, so I can think one way of counting that. Uh, basically, when I say a rectangle overlaps with the central region, there are a few cases to be considered. Like case one, the entire rectangle is inside inside that region. What a region we are talking about. So, a rectangle like this could be case one. Then case two could be uh, maybe two vertices are inside. So like a rectangle like this could be case two, and case three could be only one vertex is inside. So for example, like this. So these three are distinct cases. There are there is no overlap between the cases, right? So we can count each case separately. So so that could be one way to do it. So maybe as as a homework or exercise, try to count this way and try to match the answer. The answer should match, and uh, I mean. This is always a good practice to try for counting problems. That if you get multiple methods, find the answer with all the methods and make sure they match so that you know you are not missing anything in either method. I mean, 
there, there is a possibility that you are like, making the same mistake in both answers. That is why like, even though the answer is matching, the answer is wrong. But that will rarely happen. Okay. So, as usual, as soon as you solve the problem, what what variation can you think of this problem to make this problem slightly harder? Of course, one thing is I can just change the values, right? I can change the length. This 11 can be replaced by some variable. This 5 can be replaced by some variable. Yes, Rago? Instead of rectangles, we can keep some other irregular shapes. Yeah, we can think of some other shapes. One possible way of making this problem harder, I think, is the central region need not be parallel to the side. What if the central region is crooked? You know, imagine a shape like this. That this is my outer uh, rectangle and this is my inner rectangle. Or square. So this is the forbidden region. And now do the counting. So now it is significantly harder, right? Because it is like they like counting each region here. I mean, that needs to be done carefully. How, how do you count this region? I, I don't know. So that that could be a challenge. And I mean, here I have aligned my rectangle to the boundary, but it could be somewhere in between also. Like for example, even harder could be like this. But if a rectangle is situated in between, which is the forbidden region, that would be even harder. Okay, so try to attempt this problem because see, understand one thing. This is RMO 2004. So this is a 20 year old paper almost. So whatever RMO difficulty you are going to expect now will be significantly harder. So just because you have solved this problem does not mean that you are prepared for RMO. You should be able to solve a much harder version of this problem. Only then uh, you can say that your RMO preparation is going in the right direction. Okay, so think of these more challenging versions of the problem. One more question I could ask is, suppose, and, and you know, this is naturally suggested by what happened, that the diagram was not known to us. So we did not know where that PQR square is located, right? So what if that is the question? That find the position of PQRS for which the answer is maybe as large as possible or as small as possible. Can you think of this variation? So basically, as the position of the square changes, right, that PQRS can be here, it can be somewhere in between, it can be to a side. So there are multiple positions of PQRS, and with each position, the answer will change, right? So my question is, find the position of PQRS for which the answer is as large as possible, or as small as possible, any anything. So think of these variations and try them as well, okay? So uh, how, how would you attempt this kind of a question that you have to find the location of PQRS which maximizes the answer, for example. So can PQRS be ro 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 like rotated or it's only uh, it's parallel, parallel to the side? In some sense, I can al already see a reason why if we rotate PQRS, right, most likely the answer will be reducing, not increasing, right? Intuitively, it feels that way because the, I mean, the diagonal side, because our condition is that our rectangle should not overlap even a little bit with the in central region. So if, you know, your PQRS is slightly tinted, then this diagonal segment is going to, you know, eliminate so many corners. So these will not be allowed. So intuitively it feels that rotating PQRS will reduce the answer. So, but anyway, let us assume that we are only talking about parallel to the side. So I think one way to parameterize is that we'll define the position of the top left corner, right? We can, let us say that this offset, we you know that this is X and this is Y. 
and so you solve the question in terms of x and y, and then you have to maximize, right? Find the value of x and y for which your answer will be maximum. So in fact, we can do that. It's not that difficult to do it immediately also. So now here the one difficulty is that a1, a2, a3, a4 are no longer symmetric. So we need to compute each of them individually and subtract, right? So let us say a1 is the left one, a2 is the right one, a3 is the top one, and a4 is the bottom. Okay, so these are the set mapping. So like basically, for example, this is this region we are calling a4, like that. Okay, so then can we find the value of each of them? So first, as a lemma, do you know this counting that if I give a rectangle of size A cross B, right? A units cross B units, how many smaller rectangles are contained in that region? Do you know that answer? Yes, Rago? Be A plus 1 choose 2 times B plus 1 choose 2. Yes, correct. Because basically, uh, these vertical segments, there are A plus 1 vertical segments. Out of that, you have, you have to choose any two. And out of B plus 1 horizontal segments, you have to choose any two. So this answer is A plus 1 choose 2 times B plus 1 choose 2. Okay, so then we can quickly write all of these formulas, right? So this will be 12 choose 2 times x plus 1 choose 2. Right? A2 will be so I think 12 choose 2 will come common out of everything. And in the same way, the pairwise intersection can also be counted. So A1 intersection, A3. So the way we are set up, this is A1. A1 is here, this is here, A2 is here, and A2 is here. So there will be only four terms which survive. So for example, A1 intersection, A4. A4 intersection, A3. A3 intersection, A2. Oh, sorry, this is right. So again, applying the same formula. So we are going to get Okay, so our final count will be the sum of all of this. So we have to add all of this minus all of this, right? That will be our answer. So without simplifying it, just looking at it, can we make some estimation that what kind of values X and Y could lead us to the minimum possible or uh, maximum possible answer? Can we estimate that in some way without simplifying a lot? Like try to simplify as little as possible.
So the answer we are saying is so the answer is and note that this is a function of x and y, right? As x and y will change, your answer will change. Okay, so one thing I notice is that this problem is separable. What do you mean by separable? That the X and Y don't necessarily have to mix with each other. If you look at how the expression is set up, right? Let us simplify, uh, like let us try to evaluate the two components separately. So sigma AI, right? So sigma AI, finally your answer is this, sigma of AI and AI intersection is this. So let us simplify the both separately. In particular, look at the form, form of AI as it, sigma AI as it. Do you see it is basically the same four terms, A, B, C, D. So if I call these terms as A, B, C, D, right? A, B, B, C, D, D, and D, A. Do you see that the form of this is basically A, B plus B, C plus C, D plus B, A, correct? This is how that expression looks like. And so we can factorize this, right? How much will that be? Basically, the alternate terms will add up, right? A plus C, because A here gets multiplied with C, right? So therefore, I can say this is simply A plus C times B plus D. Okay. And so if you notice that X is occurring in exactly A and C, right? Where is X? So in other words, that all the terms of X are going to go in this bracket and all the terms of Y are going to go in this bracket. So X and Y can be completely separated that way. Okay. And if you notice this term also has the same ABCD. If you go back to the above, there is some constant outside. So this 12 choose 2 is a constant, which is extra. But apart from that, it's a constant multiplied by the same ABCD terms, right? So now can I rewrite my whole answer in a nice way? So I can write the answer as 12 choose 2 times. So A plus C. So the two terms with, with, which have X. So 7 minus X choose 2 plus X plus 1 choose 2. So th this is my A and C and plus B and D. This is B. And whole thing minus this X, X into Y, A plus A plus C and B. So this. And our question now is we want to maximize this. We want to make the answer as large as possible. So anything that we can do further to simplify this, to combine this in any way, 
any ideas i think we can simplify it even further right like temporarily let us just call this abcd because it is easier to manipulate okay let me just call them abcd then my answer is basically k times a plus c plus d plus d minus a plus c and b plus c. can i take this this also inside these brackets with a suitable constant do you see how to absorb this constant also inside the brackets because if i look at it like this this is k times a plus c plus k times b plus b minus a plus c b plus b so what is the term that i can add so that this whole thing gets factorized again what is the constant term that i can add to factorize this further i think minus k square will work nicely correct yes so if i add minus k square add and subtract okay so then this whole thing becomes k minus a minus c times k minus b minus and plus k square. so this is a very convenient thing because now what we are saying all the x are in this term and all the y are in this term and so we can separately control x and y we don't have to manipulate both of them together you know whenever you are able to separate the variables this way it is a very good thing okay uh, this is a important problem solving technique ability to separate variables yes raghav so should it be minus times the bracket uh oh yes it will be minus okay so now to maximize this so now you see the problem is become very simple to maximize this it is enough to minimize each term separately so a plus c and b plus c. and because of symmetry if we solve one the other will get solved automatically so we don't have to solve both so let us minimize a plus c so a plus c is how much 7 minus x plus 2 plus x plus 1 plus and now this is simply a quadratic in x right i think everybody can do it so understand how the original problem which may look complicated but through simplification we are able to distill it down to something that we already know but just for the sake of completion let us find the answer because i am also very curious uh, okay we are before what is our gut feeling you know let us train our instinct a little bit going back to the original problem where we are placing that central region in the uh, whole grid what what is our instinct that in which case the answer will be as large as possible will it be when the forbidden region is in the center or to one side what is your instinct because this instinct is very important it is not just that what you can prove but before you start proving you have to have a educated guess right so what is your guess that whether that pqrs should be in the center or in the corner which case you will get more rectangles my instinct is that i think the central case is the worst case i will get the least number of rectangles when pqrs is in the center and i will get the maximum rectangles when pqrs is in one corner that is my instinct and then the reason for that is that basically it is like we are talking about combinatorics right so the number of combinations is important 
and so what happens in combinatorics is that when does the number of possibilities go? Suppose I have 10 objects and out of 10 objects, I need to choose two objects. Okay. And separately, I divide that pile of 10 into two piles of five, five objects each. And now from each of those piles, I have to choose two objects. So although the, num the number of piles has increased, the number of objects in each pile has decreased. So the total number of combinations should come down is my estimate. Okay, to get the intuition which I'm hinting at. That in combinatorics, more starting objects to begin with is always better. Instead of subdividing them into smaller groups and then picking from those smaller groups might give you the smaller answer. But let us check whether we are, uh, my intuition is correct or not. So, uh, that half we can ignore because that will anyway not matter. So I will not keep writing the half every time. I'm just going to focus on the actual equation. So how much is that? 42 minus. Uh, I think I made a mistake. We have to minimize X, right? So should we maximize A plus C or minimize A plus C? We want to maximize this. So we want to we want to minimize. Uh, so we want to minimize X. See, the way this is set up, this is a constant anyway. So if this remaining value is as small as possible, then you'll be subtracting as little as possible. So we want to minimize X. And so minimize X means to maximize A plus. So this was wrong. We want to maximize. Okay. And so here, what I'm going to get 2x square and this square. Again, that 2 and 2 will cancel. Which is very nice. Okay. And so what will be the graph of this like? Where will the minima or maxima lie? And note that we are going to constrain x to the range 0 to 11. So we only care about this region, 0 to 11. Yes, Raghav? The max will be at x equals 3. 3, okay. Sorry, sorry. One thing. This way, I mean the max should, so the minimum would be at x equals 3. So I think the maximum would be at no, x no, wait, equals but I think there is a problem. I, I made some calculation mistake, I think, because uh, shouldn't this be symmetric? Like whatever value of x, the 11 minus x should give you the same answer, right? So I think I made a calculation mistake here. I think up to this point, everything is correct because here I see that symmetry. Like if I replace X with 11 minus X, the value of this does not change. But uh, let me just check the calculation after that. So that is plain. Sir. Yes. Like we have said we need to maximize the bracket with the uh, minus sign, right? We want to maximize this with the minus. No, no, yes, without the minus sign. So I was saying we have to maximize this part only. Oh, okay. Sir. Oh, no, no, that would be wrong. We have to minimize this part. Uh, let me write. Maybe I'm causing some confusion here. So we want to uh, 
Oh, actually, the that it is a kind of a trick question. The thing is, this a minus so oh, this up to this point it is valid. So we want to minimize this, but now the sign matters. So is are these terms positive or negative? So I think they will be negative, right? Let me just flip this around. So now they are they are positive. Before I think they were negative. Because K is twelve to right? No, actually we cannot say. Sometimes it will be larger, sometimes it will be smaller. So that is a difficulty that we, we don't know the signs, whether they are positive or negative brackets. So what we want to minimize is the borders. Wait, let me first complete this calculation to resolve one doubt in my mind. This will not send it. Okay, anyway, but I think I'm spending a lot of time in this calculation, but I would suggest try to complete this problem and see whether we are getting the claim that when we take X, so my guess is that if X is zero and Y is zero, that is most likely the answer. This is where you get the maximum number of rectangles, but you need to check. So one thing I'm getting confused is that here, I'm expecting this expression to remain symmetric around the central axis, right? What if what a value of X you put, if you put the value, which is the reflection of that, right? So x and 11 minus x. So both of these should give the same answer for this bracket. But for some reason, when I simplify it, it is not turning out to be so. I may have made some calculation mistake there. Okay. But see, the point is this, that don't solve just the question. Try to see how you can modify the question to do something more extra with that. Okay. And even if that means you solve one or two less problems, that is perfectly fine. Yes, Prago. Uh, sir, actually, I don't think x and 11 minus x will always work because our square is of side 5. So the maximum value x can take would be 6. Ah, okay. Yes, yes. So, so the symmetry is between which two values, not 11 minus x. I think 6 minus x, is it? In, in the square, like which two positions are symmetric? This one and this one. I think it would be x and 6 minus x. If this is x and this is x, then this is 5. So x and 6 minus x, right? Not okay. Then 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 this is correct. Okay, correct. Okay. So then this is okay. Then this expression is looking correct to me now. Because now instead of x, if you put 6 minus x, you will get the same answer. Okay, but anyway, I think you can complete the problem from this point. 
Okay, so that was question eight. Uh, what about question six? Has anybody solved question six? So what is given that A and T natural numbers uh, is good if T is an odd prime and, and three is the smallest. So do you know this concept? Have you heard this concept of primitive roots or order? Uh, Order of a order of a number. Have you heard of this concept before? If not, then uh, please check this. So you know the number theory book by David Burton. So in that, I think chapter eight. It all is all about primitive roots. Okay, it's a very interesting chapter. It is a fairly advanced chapter actually. So. Uh, for you to you know read this chapter, you you have to first become a really good champion of everything that is before that. So first task is chapter one to seven. You have to become really good because that covers basics of congruence, uh, Fermat's theorem, Euler's theorem, and once you have covered all of that, then chapter eight will be accessible to you, and that will really show you a different side of number theory. Chapter eight onwards, Burton changes completely. It is no longer an Olympiad book. It has so many other things which are told to the theory of number theory. I mean, the, you know, number theory has two parts. The exam part, which is like what are the problems they ask in a class or an exam, and the research part, that what are the unknown open questions in number theory, and what is the cutting edge research that is happening in number theory. So, if you want to get the, some idea of those kind of topics, then chapter 8 onwards is what will really, you know, introduce you to those ideas. So do read chapter eight in detail and try to do it on your own. Uh, we don't directly require it here, but it is related to the same concept. So um, okay. So what is asked is that and three is the smallest. So that. P device, right? So in other words, what are they saying that P should not divide A minus one, P should not divide A square minus one, P should only divide A cube minus. That is what they are saying. That there is no index smaller than three for which P will divide A raised to M minus one. Okay. M or Okay. So then what you have to find this is the question, right? So let me introduce the notation of the order of a number. Okay. So this is a new concept, order of a number. That is simplify this whole writing. Okay. So if you know M and N are integers or natural numbers, let K be the Or so okay. in other words, n divides. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the congruence notation, but same thing. Then
So what is the smallest index to which you should raise M so that you get that one? And sometimes the thing is, this K may not always exist. So if I should add the condition that if such a K exists, only then the order can be, there can be numbers where such a K cannot exist at all. Particularly, when will that happen if M and N are not co-prime? You know, if you look at this condition, it is necessary that M and N have to be co-prime. Okay. So if M and N are co-prime, only then such a K can exist. Otherwise, it will not exist. Right? Because otherwise, what are you going to get here? N divides M. So N divides 1. Uh, or what is that GCD, right? That GCD will have to divide 1. And that, that will be a contradiction. So this order idea is very powerful. You can take an example just to make sure you understood this idea of order. Let us say that I'm talking about M as 2 and N as 5. So basically start listing 2 raised to 1, 2 raised to 2, 2 raised to 3, 2 raised to 4, etc. And what is the first power which has a remainder of 1 when divided by 5? So if I make a list of the remainders here, so 2 raised to n is here, the remainder is 2 raised to k is here. So the remainder is 2 in this case, 4 in this case, 8 in this case, 1. Uh, so you see, the fourth term is 1. So we can say that 2 has order 4 1. That is the idea. Okay. And actually, if you think about it, many things about this order concept are similar to what we did last time. Last time we were talking about permutations, and you know, I was talking about what happens if you apply the same permutation again and again. So we are talking about if I say that permutation is denoted by sigma, then we are talking that sigma raised to some value will come back to the original permutation. Do you remember this notation that we have developed? That if there is a permutation and you apply it again and again. Sooner or later, you are going to come back to the identity. In the same way here, if you raise a, keep raising a number to the same power, uh, like again and again, then eventually it will come back to one. That is the same concept. So there is a lot of similarity between the, what analysis we did there and what is happening here. Okay. So with this order concept, it is much easier to write the problem. I can rewrite the problem in much lesser space. I could phrase the problem simply as if P is prime and K has order 3 modulus of P, find order. So do you agree that this is equivalent to the given problem? That, that is exactly what is given. The What is given to you is that 3 is the smallest index such that P divides A raised to N minus 1. So that is the same as saying A has order 3. And what you have to find is the smallest index M such that this happens. Now the thing is, in general, the order of two consecutive numbers doesn't have any relation. Like here, for example, in the numerical case that we tried, we found the order of two. So just because we know the order of two, we cannot directly make any claim or what is the order of three, the number after or before that. Every number will have its own different pattern. So it is not easy to you know, use the order of consecutive numbers in any simple way. But this is a special case. Okay, In this case, there is something special that happens. And that is why we are able to solve this problem. Okay. So how do you, how do you attempt this problem? And again, I want to repeat that all of this information about what is the order and all of that is not required to solve this problem. But having all of these tools in your uh, you know what you can say toolkit will be very useful. That is why I am adding these extra details. Yes, Raghav. 
sir so like we can just like expand a plus 1 to the n yes and using binomial theorem and then we also know that like uh, p choose k would be divisible by p for no wait but p choose k the exponent is m right it is not p yes sir but like if we take oh yes sir that one so the initial starting point what rago is mentioning let us expand this we want to find m right so our job is to find m such that and we want to find the smallest m not just any m and what is given to us is that because of the order concept we can say that p divides a minus 1 or does not divide p does not divide a square minus 1 and p divides a cube plus. so this is what is given to us so if we start expanding this with binomial theorem what do we get And we have to do everything modulo p. So whatever numbers we'll get, we'll just take the remainder modulo p. We are only interested in the remainders, right? So like if I just expand it without any other simplification. Like that. And last terms will be. one and from this i can write that a cube is formed to one model so wherever i see a cube i can replace that by one right but now the difficulty is depending on m right so this a raised to m will have maybe multiple copies of a cube and then there will be something left over like what is the remainder so depending on whether m is common to 0, 1, or 2 modulo 3, that leftover part will change, right? So for example, if I say that let m be equal to 3 times q plus r, okay, where r is that remainder. So then a raised to m will be a raised to 3 q times a raised to r. And out of that, this part I can say is common to 1, right? So this whole thing will be common to a raised to r. And uh, because of the remainder, this R can be 0, 1, or 2, right? So this term is either 1, A, or A square. But we don't know which. It will depend on the choice of M. Whatever is the remainder of M, that will decide the remainder over here. So uh, I don't know. Even I tried this approach. And we, we can make it work. I, I will come to that point after i discuss the simpler solution so do you, does uh, does anybody have a simpler solution see what is the simplest thing you can do keep trying the values of m right start from m equal to 1 try 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 keep trying in order whichever of, of them you simplify and you can see that is the answer so there is nothing wrong with that and in fact that is how we, i will i am going to do it now okay it's not that difficult Okay, so let me erase this for now. I'll come back to this trick after some time. Okay, so what I'm going to do, let us keep trying. Let us try. So first, will m equal to one more? No, why? If, if m equal to 1, then what will happen? Then the expression we are looking at is a plus 1 raised to 1 minus 1, which is simply a. And can, can p divide a? p cannot divide a, right? Because uh, what is given to us is p divides a cube minus 1. So if 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 p divides a, then p will also divide a cube. So which means that p is dividing to consecutive terms, which is a contradiction, right? 
So therefore, m is equal to one is not possible. Okay. So then, what about m equal to two? Then the expression is. So that is is square plus two. What about this? Can this be a multiple of uh, p? So let us do one thing. We can simplify this little bit to get some information. See what is the factorization of a cube minus one? It is simply. And out of this, we already know that p does not divide this part. So therefore, p has to divide this part, right? So this is a very useful expression because what we can do, we can always compare uh, compare this a square plus a plus one with whatever we are getting. So like if p divides this, if p divides this and p divides this, then p also has to divide a difference, right? And how much is the difference? The difference is a minus one, right? Which is a contradiction because again and again we are going to make use of this information that p does not divide any of these terms. And from here also, do you see that p does not divide a plus one also? So p does not divide a minus one. P does not divide a plus one. P does not divide a. But p divides a square plus a plus one. So we have to use these things again and again. That is all that is required here. Okay. So here also there is a contradiction. So m is not equal to two. So like that you can keep going. Uh, let me give you a few minutes to try this. I want you to try this and find the answer. So try equal to m three four etc. See if you can find the value of m that way.
Yes, Drago. Well, I, I think I found the answer for using a different approach rather than okay. casework. Should I share it okay. afterwards? Uh, no, I think you can tell me now also because, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, sir. So we know that a plus one would be congruent to a plus a cube mod p. Uh, wait, right. A plus one is congruent to what? A plus a cube mod p. A plus a cube mod p. Yes, correct. And if you consider like that to the power m, which, yeah. Okay. Both both sides to the power m. Yes, sir. Okay. And then uh, you can take out a com a common. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, a this is equal to like uh, a to the m times a plus a square to the m. Yes. No, a to the m times one plus. So yeah, one, uh, one plus one plus a square. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then like uh, we can like we know one plus a square is like a minus a mod m. Mm -hmm. No, so, I think I have a different idea here. Why don't we apply binomial theorem to this directly? Then don't you see that everything else? No, it won't cancel. Okay. Okay, continue. What are you saying? Yes, so, so then like uh we can have we'll have like minus a square. This will be congruent to minus a square uh to the m. Uh, so this is common to minus a, right? That is what you're using? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is common to a raised to m times minus a raised to m. Well, yes, well, like if m is equal to 3, then I think this should, if m, if m is divisible by 6, mm -hmm. the sign cancels out and we have to the 3. Like, so I think it should work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so now at this point, a plus 1 raised to m, what we have shown is a plus 1 raised to m is congruent to minus a square m. And we can separate this as minus 1 raised to m and a raised to 2m. And what you're saying is correct that if m is 6, for example, then, then this will be equal to 1. And yes, answer is m is equal to 6. But can, are you able to prove with this that no smaller value of m can work? Because that is also uh, part of what they are asking, right? So like any odd of n will definitely not work. Because any then you have a minus. Because if minus 1 to the m is there, then... Uh, but I mean, we don't know what, what is... Uh, okay. It, it yes, but then we, we can't be sure in every case. Sure, yeah. I mean, depending on the value of a. Like, what if a itself is 1? I know, actually, we can be sure that a is not congruent to 1. Yes, sir. That's not okay. So, yes, what you're saying is correct. Odd value of m will definitely not work. And even value of m, so actually, the number of trials are very small. So, we can finish it manually also, right? So, this is much easier to try. So, let m be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We can directly evaluate the RFS in each case. So if m is 1, then it is simply minus a square, a raised to 4, minus a raised to 6, which is common to minus 1, then a raised to 8, a raised to 1, a square. This is much easier to do. I agree. Okay. Uh, but in case you are not able to think of this idea, you can do it this way also. Like what we were doing before. Just keep simplifying each of them. And every time you will find that whatever expression comes is slightly larger or smaller than perfect multiple of P. Okay, and that is why that will not work out. Just to show an example, let us just write few more terms here. So, if m is equal to 3, so if, if m is 3, 
then the expression you are talking about is a plus one raised to three minus one is a square plus three a plus three. Now if I compare this with what I know is p divided a square plus a plus one, and so if I compare, so if if p divides this, then p also has to divide the difference, which is two a plus three, and so which is p divides a plus one, which is a contradiction. Okay. If m is equal to four, then I get a raised to four. For it, and again, some better I can simplify this. And again, if P divided is one plus A. Then P also divides six A four plus And so if I subtract this from this, if I take the difference, what it means is that we also have to divide minus three a plus six and minus so therefore p divides three a minus or so so p is three or p divides a minus two, and you can show contradiction in each case. When I did this problem at home, it was not like that. Oh, I made a mistake here. Uh, this this a cube is not without a, it's not only one. So then this simplifies us. Okay. And now if I subtract so I get a plus. Okay. So in this case also you get a contradiction. So in every case you will keep getting contradiction. Only in the case of m is equal to six, you will not get a contradiction. So that is the case where it will work out. So this was one way to do it, but if we go back to that first idea which Raghav you said, right? Like binomial expansion. The difficulty here was that. So we were trying to expand a plus one raised to m minus one, and we wrote the expansion as a raised to m plus m plus m minus like that. And what we know is that every third term is a. Uh, we know the power of a cube power to one, right? So every third term we can regroup together. So what we said is that let m be p q plus r, where r is a the what a remainder we are going to get. Okay. So uh, there is one generalization of the standard combinatorial identity that we know. So do we know the formula of alternate like m choose zero plus m choose two. Have you studied this formula? What is the sum of the alternate terms? Have you seen that? I'm not sure. Have you already covered this in your lecture? Or if this is new to you, then we have to cover that first. So when when we apply binomial theorem to one minus one raised to n, do we get this?
like this alternate terms we get alternate positive and negative terms right and so and this is of course zero is to m which is zero and therefore the identity that you get is alternate sums m to zero m to two m to four will be equal to alternate sum this way. Okay. And further, we already know that the sum of these two together. So if I call this sum as A and this sum as B, then we already know that A plus B, which is the sum of all the terms, this is 2 raised to M. And so if a plus b is 2 raised to m and a is equal to b, then what, what can we say? Therefore, a and b are both equal to half of that, right? 2 raised to m minus 2. So uh, in case this is not covered for you, maybe we'll do that in one lecture. But if not, you, you can also do it. It's not that difficult. So the same thing can be generalized to this, like m to 0 plus m to 3 plus m to 6. So this kind of series can also be expanded in a similar way. Uh, so if, if you attempt it that way, you can also do the problem in the original form. So what you will do is you will regroup every third term. So a raised to m, a raised to m minus 3, a raised to m minus 6. So all of these terms you can group together and simplify one bracket. What I'll do is I'll actually write this solution and send it on the group. Okay. Because it is quite complicated, so let us not get into the details right now. But I will encourage uh, you to read whatever like write-up I send you. Okay, that that will show this trick, like how to group every third term, every fourth term. Those kinds of tricks are involved in that case. Okay. Okay. Then coming to some other questions, so. What about question one? So question one was find all n such that is an integer. Anybody has solved this question? I haven't solved it, but I was able to prove that if n is greater than or equal to four, then uh, if if n is an integer solution for this, like if it is an if the sum is integer at n, then it it is not an integer at n plus one or n minus one. So like oh. no three integer solutions of this expression are consecutive. Okay. I was able to prove that, but okay. I, I'm trying to think what hint can be given to solve this question. So as such, if you think about it, right, this question is a very easy target because you are supposed to show that this sum is an integer. And because the denominator has so many factors, right? Because every factorial is coming in the denominator, one factorial, two factorial, every factorial term is coming in the denominator. So even if one of them causes an issue, then this will not be an integer, right? So what is your gut feeling that will this have a lot of solutions or very few solutions? Uh, sir, uh, to me, I have some camera to button one again. Uh, so I think for you, one white is clear. I think let's see don't button so do Okay. So what is your uh, you know in, intuition that will this have a lot of solutions or very few solutions? 
Very few. Very few. Very, right? few. Because, very few. Because I mean, any number that comes in the denominator which does not divide the numerator, it will immediately cause. What is the problem? सर आता परत कॅमेरा बंद झाला परत कॅमेरा बंद झाला मग ते कुठलं बटन आहे मला माहित नाही आय थिंक त्याच्यात लिहिलेलं असतील बघ हा मधलं जे पांढरं बटन आहे ना वेगळ्या कलरच ते असेल असं वाटतंय मला मग ते सोडून बाकी बंद केले तरी चालतं सो इफ द डिनोमिनेटर इज गोइंग टू गिव अस ऑल द पॉवर पद बंद हा ठीक आहे सो डिनोमिनेटर इज गोइंग टू गिव अस लॉट ऑफ पॉवर सो वी कॅन चूज एनी सुटेबल यु नो फॅक्टर फ्रॉम द डिनोमिनेटर अँड जस्ट चेक वेदर दॅट डिनोमिनेटर इज डिवायडिंग द न्युमिनेटर ऑर नॉट अँड दॅट इज सफिशंट टू प्रूव्ह वेदर इट्स अन इंटिजर ऑर नॉट so let us let us first take the lcm so how much the lcm will be 1 upon n factorial and what will the bracket inside look like can you write so cut it say yet as 8 5 10 minutes so how will you write the term inside carefully if, if i say the general term is 1 upon d factorial starting from the first term so what will the first term become all all the terms become n n minus 1 all the way up to 2 so the first term becomes this the second term will become n in n all the way up to 3 so you see it like will like a pyramid every time the number of terms will keep decreasing right in general for the d the d term the d term will expand to n into n into n minus 1 n minus 2 what will be the last term of this series for the d term it will be d plus 1 right so so the sum of all of this is the bracket after to take the lcm and so continuing what are the last two terms write the last two terms very carefully so uh, in the original expression the last terms are n upon n minus 2 factorial n upon n minus 1 factorial plus n upon n factorial so write what will be the top of n minus 2 factorial it will be n into n into n minus 2 then what will be the term of this one if you notice up till this point we have had two copies of n but now it will be n into n so here also we have two copies of n but the last one will not have a additional copy of n right so this is how that whole expression is looking like okay so looking at all of this can you think of which denominator which factor in the denominator i can use as the litmus test which factor will be most convenient for me to get rid of majority of these terms yes drago sir n minus 1 yes i think n minus 1 will be very useful right because in almost all the terms n minus 1 is already a multiple right so what is our claim is that since we are claiming that this is an integer right if i call this s 
S, which is equal to this whole numerator upon n factor. So let me call this whole bracket as the numerator. Okay. So as S is n upon n factorial, which is an integer, and so therefore the denominator has to divide the numerator, and n minus one is one of the factors of the denominator. Therefore, n minus one has to divide this capital N. Okay, so in other words, this whole bracket has to be multiple of n minus one, right? And so, if, if what that means, so if capital N, so n minus one divides capital N, then out of these all these terms, already n minus one was dividing anyway. So th these terms can be eliminated, and so the only thing that is left over is n minus one has to divide the last two terms, n square plus. And so now the number of possibilities for this is going to be very small. So I think, uh, what do we get now? So for example, we already know that n minus one divides n square minus one, right? So if I just subtract the two, I'll get n minus n one divides two n, or uh, n minus one divides two n minus two. So again, subtracting, I'll get n minus one divides. So therefore, n minus one can be Minus two, minus one, one or two. So in other words, n itself can be either two or three. Right. So two, two and three are the only allowed value. Okay, is that fine? So understand that the question looks complicated, but using the right. Uh, you see that there's just one thing that if you pick the correct thing, which finishes the problem very quickly. So identifying that correct thing is what we have to learn through experience. So yes. here the observation was that we are being told that some fraction is a integer, which means that we have to choose some factor in the denominator which is going to divide the numerator, and which is already present in the numerator in majority of the terms. See, this n minus one was already conveniently present in majority of the terms, so that is why we only had to worry about the last two terms. Okay. So, but n equal to one is also uh, like also gives an integer value, right? N equal to one also gives an integer value. That is correct. Uh, I think you have to treat it like a special case because when you put n equal to one, right? Some of these expressions. Don't simplify in the same way. So I think we should treat n equal to one as a special case. But yes, you're right. So then the answer is actually n is one, two, or three. Yeah, but good point. So yeah, we have to be careful about corner cases that way. Okay, question two. I think question two should have been straightforward if you know AMGM, RMS kind of inequalities. So from every problem that you're solving, make sure that you're learning the technique that what is the most important tool or idea that helps you to find the solution. So pay attention to that every time. So for example, in question two, you will see that again, it's a very simple problem. If you do just one thing, so what is that one thing that you need to do to make this problem very simple? Looking at the problem, what do you think? What kind of simplification will be useful? You know, get a feel what the problem is trying to say first. It is writing something very complicated, but at the heart of it, there is a very simple information that is given. See this x plus y, y plus z, z plus x. 
these three terms do you see they are like the building blocks i can use them to rewrite this whole expression so you see this kind of substitution could be useful let us call them as maybe abc okay yes raghav but we can directly use rms here right we can directly use rms here okay uh, so rms for these three terms you are saying so yes sir three. okay so some of these three will be less than or equal to root of their square some of these upon and yes if you find that this this uh, this is essentially going to be each term will occur two times right so this whole thing will be two so this is square root of two then and if you take three on this side you are done correct right. so it's really a one line or two line question okay. but for that there was kind of a missing we didn't see that that am rms can be used here that was the missing jump i will say that if you don't see that jump why why should you try to apply am rms rms here that is the question so one reason i could say that looking at the term right there are square roots here i want to get rid of the square roots so i need to square these terms and what is the identity i know where something a square plus b square plus c square is involved so that is the rms right root mean square but suppose you didn't think of this idea then what else can you do so what i am suggesting is why don't we give these some sensible names right we can call this as a b and c okay so this is my new substitution that let x plus y be a Oh, sorry, x plus y is c, y plus z is a, and z is x b. Okay, so if I make this substitution, and now do you see, I can write x plus y plus z also in the same terms. X plus y plus z will be simply a plus b plus c, right? Which is looking like a semi-perimeter. Interesting. If you notice, this is like a semi-perimeter. So, so now can I rewrite this as root root a plus root b plus root c upon root of x plus y plus z, which was root of a plus b. Okay. So what I want to prove is if I take this to the other side. And there is a uh, root here also. Okay. Now at this point again, I think AM RMS is a good suggestion. Now I can clearly see that this, if I consider these as my terms, right, like alpha, beta, gamma, then the squares of those terms are coming inside the bracket. so everything the setup is very nice to apply am rms inequality here yes but you can do it in the original question also i mean both both approaches are fine but uh, the fact that this X Y uh, X plus Y Y plus Z etc can be replaced by A B C. It has an implication that there may be some geometric connection of this idea. Is that a possibility? Because you know this is a very standard substitution in our in center configuration. What we do, right? Our the points where the in center touch the opposite side. So we very often denote these as X. Y and Z, and you see the same same calculations are involved in both cases, right? This this values and this diagram, and this is equal to S. So you see how can I can state this problem as a geometric inequality? 
I could have said that in a triangle ABC, prove that what will be this root of A plus root B plus root C is less than or equal to root 3 times root C. So you see how it was an algebraic inequality, but actually there is a geometric version of that also. Okay, so think about that, that what are the connections with the geometry for this question?
सो आता हा तुम्हाला स्पेस झाले दिसतोय म्हणजे मी दिसत नाही बोर्ड प्रॉब्लम बोर्ड नीट दिस म्हणजे मी तिकडे गेला तर मी दिसेल तुम्हाला पण बोर्ड वरच काही वाचता येणार नाही तिथे जाऊन मी बोलतो ऑडिओ येईल तुम्हाला पण स्क्रीन वर दिसणार If we wanted to do some experiments, and we were planning to do this for quite some time. Now, because you have come, okay, and you have the idea of not coming to Pune, so we really, <laughs> so therefore, uh, okay. So you guys, leave me now. So, have you done this problem? Anybody already? Uh, 
by the way uh, how is the audio are you able to hear me yes okay yes sir yes. okay go ahead rohan yes sir. so uh, angle fbg is equal to angle fdg yes and angle fdg oh no sorry can fdg is equal to what which angle fbg fbg okay correct and angle fdg is equal to gac because fd and ac are parallel right. Right. so the fact that these are midpoints means that this line is parallel and half of this line right? be parallel to this okay so therefore this angle okay. yes, so now by converse of tangent secant theorem the circle mm -hmm. path to BAG is tangent to AC. Yes, correct. So I can draw a circle like this. Something like this. Right? So it will be tangent over here. Yes. Okay. Now, by, by the tangent secant theorem for sides, EG into EB is equal to EA square. Correct. Okay. So the power and P will give us that. Okay. And EA is AC by 2 and EG is EB by 3. So we get that. And uh, so the common convention is you use small a, small b, small c for the three sides and M subscript A. So M A, M B, M C. We can use that to denote a median lens. Okay. So in that notation, can you express what we want to? Uh, calculate next. So EG is M MB by three, right? Yeah. And EB is MB. And EA will be how much? EA, EA is, is B, B by, by two. So this is oh. B square by four. Okay. So uh, the ratio between uh, MB and B is the same as the ratio between MB and C. Yes, because what is given here is two times MB is root 3 times c and here what we are getting is basically 2 times mb is root 3 times b okay. so putting these together what can we say uh m uh, b is equal to c b is equal to c so this is isosceles triangle okay after that and then so uh, S, uh cf is a uh, cf is perpendicular to ab cf is perpendicular no, no, no. to not yet a AD is perpendicular to. So right now what we have shown is that these two sides are equal, and so this is perpendicular. And okay. so CF is also perpendicular to AB because BFGD yes. is cyclic. So because of the cyclic nature, this is ninety degrees, so this will also be ninety degree, and then you can finish the problem because then that means that this CF is also the median and the perpendicular the altitude. So therefore ABC has to be equilateral. Okay, is this fine for everybody? Any alternate approaches? More or less, anything that you do will be a combination of angle chasing and some length chasing. So one more way to do the length chasing could be using maybe like Apollonius theorem, right? Because uh, the lengths of the medians can be expressed in terms of the side very easily. And so that could be also one way to do this problem. Yeah, I don't think there is much like what what can you vary in this problem can you create some variation of this problem i don't know i'm thinking maybe if i was going two cyclic quadrilaterals Instead of here, the two information we want to be was that one cyclic quadrilateral and one length information. What if instead of that, I'm given two cyclic quadrilaterals? So let us say, for example, consider this alternate problem. Uh, can I erase this? So suppose given that B, same as before, B, the GF are still cyclic. 
and also another set of four points. Let us say C, D, G is given side. Does that imply? So, suppose these two cyclic quadrilaterals are given. Does that lead to an immediate conclusion? Yes, sir, Raga. Yes, sir. So, like we have angle BFD equals A. Okay. Therefore, angle BGD would be equal to A. BGD equal to A. Yes, correct. Then you have A equals C. Because our CDG is cyclic. Yes, correct. Yes, correct. So, yeah, that is very And then similar. Then you yeah. get B equals height yeah. and then yeah. 99. Yeah, that's what I feel like. I don't think there is a much scope here to create a really difficult problem. But yeah, sometimes they can be really difficult. That uh, I, there, there is one in more problem I remember where similar kind of information was given and you have to show that it is an equilateral triangle. I will try to find that problem and send it to you. Okay. We have only less than 10 minutes left, so I don't think we can solve any more problems. But uh, keep this in mind that what we are doing today, that don't just solve a problem, try to construct variation, generalizations of every problem and try those problems. Because as I said that this is an old RMO paper, so it is relatively easier. But now the difficulty levels are significantly harder now. So keep that in mind. Okay. Then uh, in the remaining time, let me just discuss a couple of questions which I had left last time. As you know, open problems for you to think about. Uh, based on last time discussion. So one of the things that we had talked about was derangements. So in derangements, we found the formula for dn, right? The number of ways to arrange n objects with no fixed point, right? So number of ways to arrange or permute n objects with no fixed point. So I had suggested to you that why don't we try to find the formula for uh, same question, but with r fixed points. So exactly r fixed points. So, uh, are you able to find that formula? Yes, Rohan? Yes, sir. So, uh, sir, we can first choose the uh, R, R terms from N, and then yes. we apply the standard derangement formula to N minus R terms, and then yes. we multiply by N choose R. Yes, right. So, the answer will be, first, we are going to choose R, any, we are going to choose which R points will remain fixed. So, that can be done in N choose R with. Once we have chosen those that they will not change, then everything else has to necessarily change, right? So then the remaining terms have to be uh, applied the same derangement. So this is what that formula will be. Okay. And uh, so this was the first part, but I'd also ask you to think that can we verify that this is the right formula by adding up all the values? So if I add the possibilities for zero fixed point, one fixed point, etc. All the way from zero to n. Then I expect this sum to be equal to dn, right? Uh, or sorry, not dn, n factorial, right? Because every every single permutation will fall into one of these brackets. Like either that permutation is zero fixed point or one fixed point or two fixed point, all the way up to n. So does this uh, formula satisfy this identity? That that would be interesting to check. So expanding this further, so this is n choose r into. So what was the formula for the dn that we derived last time? I think it was n minus r factorial into. And inside the bracket, you get this alternate term, right? Alternate plus minus kind of term. And I think last term will be minus one raised to n minus r. Can you please confirm this is the right formula? Yes, so this is the right. The right. Okay. So then if we simplify this, so here this n minus r factorial will cancel with term one term from inside. And so we'll get n factorial upon r factorial times this whole summation. And now I'm asking you to 
add one more summation on top of this. So this is already one level of summation. I factor it. So this was dn n comma r. And now what I'm asking is, what happens if I add the dn comma r itself? So, so this sum is a double sum actually. Is the summation over? Uh, let's use a different variable. Let, let us use j inside, and we we'll use i. Also. So, sigma of i going from zero to n of sigma of J going from zero to n minus r. Right, it will not be r. I'm making mistake here. Ah, okay. Maybe the right index to choose here is r, not i, because we are using r here anyway. So let me rewrite this part. So d of n comma r is this, and we want to sum this d of n comma r. As r is going from zero to n, okay. So therefore, this will be summation of this. So you see, there is a double summation happening. There is a sum outside, and there is another sum inside. Okay. So how do you simplify this and? Our expectation is that eventually this will be equal to n factorial. Let me just move this out a bit. So, how do we regroup these terms exactly? That is the question. Yes, Rago. So, like I have an idea that like maybe you can. Uh, group all the terms with like minus one to the j upon j factorial. Um, so okay, like so it would like well, like uh suppose minus suppose like uh if you consider one upon two factorial, it will appear in when you have one fixed point or uh, two fixed points all the way till n minus two fixed points. Yes, correct. So the idea here is what we can sometimes call exchanging or changing the order of the summation. So you know we can visualize this as a two-dimensional grid. Okay, so I can draw this as a grid, where on the horizontal axis, let us say I have all the vertical axis I have r. So r is going from zero all the way up to n, and for each value of r in the horizontal direction, I am summing j. So j goes from zero, one, two, etc. So when r is zero. Uh, I am going to sum all the way from zero, one, two up to n. When r is one, I am going to sum to n minus one. And like that, this kind of a triangular pattern. You see, the last term when r is equal to n, there is only one term inside. So this kind of a triangular region we are trying to sum. And currently, what we are doing is the outer sigma is going over the rows, and for each row, then the inner sigma is going over each within the row. But I think what Raghav is suggesting, why don't we exchange the order? Okay, so let us add the columns first. So let us take all the values where j equal to zero together, take all the values where j equal to one, and then once we have added all the columns together, then we'll add all the columns together to get the final answer. So in other words, in terms of the mathematical expression, we are just going to exchange the two sum. Okay, actually we are already out of time. I'll just write the expression here. But I'll encourage you to work the details offline. So now what will happen is that the outer sigma will go for all j goes from zero to n. And now for each such value of j, I need to check what are the values of r that are going to be uh, applied. So if I choose any particular column of j, for that particular j, r will going from zero to j only, right? And minus one is to j. And this n minus r, n factorial upon r factorial. Ah oh, no, what will happen to n factorial upon r factorial? I think that r factorial will so come inside. So actually, it should be inverted, like and minus one to the j over j factorial. It should go before the second summation. Okay, 
But anyway, I am not sure if I have written it correctly because I wrote in a hurry. But you can try to watch this at home, and we'll discuss next time. And again, for next time also, I'll send you one more RMO paper, and we'll discuss. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.